So I'm going to be showing a video, but if you're squeamish, you might want to cover your eyes. Oh my goodness. This one has been living in there a very, very long time. I'm not going to need to eat for a week after this one. Would you describe this video? But did you notice that you also smiled a little? Some of you even giggled. When we ran facial coding on people who were watching this video, the dominant emotion detected was actually happiness. <laughs> you can't really see it very well because it's a bit purple, the colouring, but this rise here, this bit is actually happiness. And there's a, quite a bit of surprise, because obviously you're all wondering what's going to happen to that worm. But that big peak at the end, right, the blue is disgust, but look at the yellow. And that's exactly when the worm spurted as well. We might not like to admit it, but we often find disgusting things funny. It's why toilet humour works so well. And our face never lies. So this is Eli Manning. If, not sure if you've heard of him. But Eli and Peyton Manning are brothers who are both NFL players, but on different teams. So I'm going to show you Eli's face as he watches uh, Peyton win a touchdown. So winning the Super Bowl, essentially. <laughs> so I call this the face that launched a thousand tweets. The press bureau that came over this, you know, all, all the media went crazy because they said, Eli, are you bitter that your brother won? And then Eli was like, oh, no, no, no. He was denying it. But we ran facial coding on that <laughs> clip as well. You see quite a fair bit of surprise, anger, disgust, <laughs> but I don't see any happiness. But how did you know what was Eli's true feelings? He said he wasn't unhappy. Well, you read his emotions. You realized that the rational interpretation of his words needs to be flipped once you take into account emotional cues. In a way, all decision-making is coloured by emotion. Some of the de decisions we think are decisions are actually just, uh, just post-rationalisation of subconscious feelings. Think about your favourite movie. Why do you like it? Your general takeaway was probably that it was fantastic. Only when probed do you really try to rationalise why did you really like it in the first place. This is one reason why movie and book recommendations really struggle. How we feel like watching just really depends on our mood that day. Some days we want The Godfather, and on others we just want Legally Blonde. <laughs> Even the same movie with the same story can take us on a completely different emotional journey depending on editorial style. For example, The Usual Suspect. The twist at the end is really what makes it great, that frisson of surprise. But what is also really surprising to me is the fact that current discourse on AI today hasn't really touched on emotional empathy at all. Artificial intelligence is a fairly ambiguous term. But we can generally understand it as giving machines the capability to do things that are traditionally associated with human capability. For example, visual perception, problem solving, or speech recognition. In fact, most of these technologies are built off human cognitive models in the first place. For example, neural networks. Essentially, we are giving machines the ability to think. But we haven't really talked about giving machines the ability to, to feel. And this is probably why predictive models don't really work out that well. Humans are ultimately still governed by our emotional impulses. And computers that don't take emotions into account will never understand why a species that has all the information in the world at their fingertips chooses to spend most of their time watching cat videos. The best butlers know what to give us before we even know we want it. If we want to advance the intuitiveness of machine intelligence, we need to give them the ability to emotionally empathise with us. 
Otherwise, computers will never understand why humans are so terrible at logic, why our delights are still so primitive. So let's take a step back now and look at two aspects of emotional empathy development in children. The first is probably understanding what other people are feeling. And the second, I would say, would be being able to act appropriately according to the situation. So children have to learn this. Some are really fast at it. Some take a little bit longer. I was always in that second group. I remember when I was six, there was this little girl crying. And all I could think of was, why is she so inconsiderate? She's making so much noise. It was only when I saw everyone else running towards her then I realized, actually, that's a sign of distress. And also, you're meant to be comforting when people cry. So it's funny, so some people just know what to do or say immediately. For me, I've always had to take a pause and look at what the adults are doing. It's how I learned how to cry at funerals. <laughs> Too dark? <laughs> Crowd emotion is also teaching machines how to mimic the ability to detect and react to emotions. Thanks to thousands of volunteers who have sent us videos of their faces, we are developing a system that is capable of detecting facial muscle movement. So here you see the computer is actually learning where his face is. And what is just the surrounding, what's just the face, and can see his emotions being detected. Simultaneously, advances in computer vision means we're now able to map eye pupil movement to an XY coordinate on the screen. So this means, obviously, with consent, that the computer can actually track gaze attention, knowing exactly where people are looking, how long they spend looking at it. As more and more data is fed into the system, the biometric identification capabilities of AI will improve over time. Right now, I would say we have sort of attained what I said was stage one earlier, machines being able to detect emotions. But right, we're also working on trying to get it to stage two. So what, you know, machines being able to react according to that information it has detected. Hopefully, at some point, we will be able to get things like emotion-based recommendation, so we're one step closer to an emotionally personalized world. Right now, media companies are already using emotion AI to create better content. For example, an interesting experiment was actually ran with BBC Earth, where they independently asked a production company to create a trailer, the normal way. So what the production company did was they stitched together seven scenes from the raw documentary into a one minute clip. Emotion AI, though, actually identified two key scenes as where engagement peaked. So what's quite interesting was that the creatives, the artisans, actually went away and used this data to create a new version of a trailer. So you can see on, on the screen how they performed against one another. Although the AI-generated video didn't perform as well as the artisan-created one, the insights from the Emotion AI powered with the creativity of the human mind actually allowed for creation of even better content. So right now, this is still very early stage technology, but hopefully by embedding empathy into AI systems, we will be able to create technology that is sensitive to human needs as well as help us solve interesting problems. Thank you.